Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and uh, I'm looking today at taking an image that I took on a camera a few years ago, processing it and printing it. Now I'm going to look at enlargement and also how I actually process the geometry of the image and in particular address some aspects of sharpening because uh, a lot of people have asked me how you sharpen uh, images for print. It's it depends, it can be a complex thing. Now I've written some articles on this and I'm going to be doing some more detail in it. But this is the sort of stuff that for detail, I really need to cover in an article. Uh, once I've written the article, I'll see if I can do a video that summarizes it. But I'm afraid for those of you that uh, don't like reading articles, tough, you'll have to wait. Um, it's why I regard myself as number one a photographer, number two a writer, and way down the list a video maker. Um, now I I'm, I'm appreciate the fact that people like some of these videos and I will try and get the idea across in it. But if this hasn't got enough detail in it for you, by all means please do ask questions. Email me at Northlight. Um, in fact, the emails often give me ideas for things to cover in videos and articles. So. Here we go, I'm going to take a picture of Wells Cathedral that I took. Now, you may have seen a, a print, black and white print that I've done of the steps up to the chapter house at Wells Cathedral. Now that's based on uh, an image taken by F.H. Evans in 1908, 1905, can't remember which. Um, and that's a classic architectural image. This is another one I took on that visit. So this was taken at least 10 years ago. The camera used was my old Canon 1DS Mark III. So a mere 21 megapixels. Now, by modern standards, 21 megapixels on a full frame camera, mm, a little bit, I think, even the EOS RP I'm using for shooting this does 26 megapixels. But I know in the past I produced some great images. And in fact, I used to use it for client work nobody complained about lack of resolution. It's nowhere near as important as some people would have you believe. But anyway, here's the image. It's taken with a fisheye lens. Now, I'm looking up in the tower underneath the scissor arches, which are a feature of Wells Cathedral. Um, they help stop it fall down. Um, Quite often scissor archers were added when the towers were not quite strong enough. I can't remember the precise details of the architecture here, but it's one of those features. Now, this is looking straight up in the tower. So the circular fisheye lens gives you a field of view of 180 degrees from edge to edge of the frame, of the circle. Now, it's not a full circle since I've zoomed in a bit. Now, the particular lens here is an EF815. I put a link to my review of the 8 to 15. Sorry, folks, it's not a video one. It dates from long before I started doing videos, but it's got lots of pictures in it. Um, so there's a picture. It's looking straight up. Now, very few prints printed as circular images work well as prints. Now I've done a few where I've printed circular images in a square sheet of paper and they can look good. Now you often have to process the edges to make sure the black around the edge is truly black and there's a few bits like that. But what I'm going to use here is some software called Fisheye Hemi. Now I've used this for years for processing um, uh, aspects of fisheye lenses. The original version which I used for uh, a black and white version of this image is just three basic settings. You just run it, it's a Photoshop plugin, it does a correction. Interestingly enough, the developers of Fisheye Hemi produced it for handling wide angle photos taken of groups of people. And their uh, particular, or uh, their sort of key aspects of it, it's aimed at people like wedding photographers taking photographs of large groups of people with wide angle lenses and correcting the kinds of distortions you get. And it works exceedingly well for that, but I don't do weddings, I don't very often take photographs of groups of people. So that's, I've found that this works really well for architectural images. In particular, this one here, um, I can unscrunch it. Now we'll see that in a moment, but I'm just gonna go quickly through the process I'm working. Remember this is a, 26 megapixel, uh, sorry, 21 megapixel image. 
it's a raw file. I've always shot uh, raw files, raw and JPEG. JPEGs are just for backup, but raw files. And I've opened this in Adobe Camera Raw. Now, what I would say is if you're going back to old images that you've looked at before, when you open them up, there may be changes in the raw processing. So some things may change. In general, raw processing software these days is vastly superior to raw processing software 10, 15 years ago in all kinds of subtle ways. Overall, it just works. It works the same. But there are all kinds of subtle differences which you may want to investigate depending on what you're doing, how you're going to process the image. But there's the image. Now, if I open this up in Camera Raw, loads of adjustments. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to correct the image for brightness, overall tonality. I'm not going to do much to it. And in fact, I'm going to, because it's a small image and I want to print it at a fair size, I'm going to turn down the sharpening in Camera Raw right down. Why am I going to do that? Because I'm going to sharpen it afterwards before I resize it. Now, I've looked at sharpening resizing quite a bit. I've got several videos looking at this and the articles that go with them that look at aspects of it. And I found that to use, which is currently, and I say currently because these things can change, uh, currently my favorite is Topaz Gigapixel AI for resampling. However, I found that taking old images and applying some sharpening to them with Sharpen AI first, with it perhaps knocked back a little bit from the full intensity, it would suggest, then resized, gives you images which print very well. Now, I've, I've got some more of this in the written articles where I look at more details. And obviously in the written articles, I can include photos and stuff that you can click on and zoom and see actual detail in it. But suffice to say, my current preference for images is to take the images sharpen them a little bit, then resize them. And I'll look at a few other aspects which I might do before printing as well in a moment when it comes to making prints. But here's the color image for that. Now I've tweaked that. I've not changed much. Most of the things I've needed to correct are things like chromatic aberration. Not much on the EF8 to 15 uh, fisheye, but there is a bit. There's also a bit of purple fringing. So in the raw controls and that, I've just tweaked it for a few little adjustments just to prove the image. I'm not changing the geometry of the lens here. I'm doing corrections for vignetting, but I'm not changing so-called distortion. Distortion is a feature of the lens projection geometry. I'm not interested in changing that. Now, I've loaded up that image into uh, the current version of Fisheye Hemi. Now, the current version of Fisheye Hemi is a distinct difference to the early version. The early version, I'll say, it had like three settings. You fired up version A, B, or C of the uh, software, depending on what sort of image you had. And it works exceedingly well. The new version has sliders, so you can adjust the effect and change various things. But anyway, I've got this and I've stretched out the image to turn it from a circular image into a rectangular image. Now, the rectangular image is there, is now okay. Now, it looks somewhat pale on this because I'm going to be converting this to black and white at some point, which means I've kept my color image in as large a color space as I can manage. Now, that is pro photo. Fisheye Hemi doesn't color manage properly, so I get a washed out looking uh, version of the image there with the colors not looking quite right. That is purely an artifact of the fact that the color management is not working okay with the large image, the large uh, image space that I'm using for editing here. Nothing to be worried about. Um, yeah, that's, that's a problem for the developers to fix. Uh, and in fact, I haven't updated this for a bit, so maybe even they've fixed it, because I know I did report it to them when I first tested this software. So I have this stretched image. Now, I need to crop it. I need to make a few other slight adjustments just to tidy it up a bit, but I want to resize it. And essentially I'll make those fine tuning adjustments after I've done the resizing. So I've resized it here and it's huge. Um, it should comfortably print even at 
with this 24 inch printer here, it should easily print at over 600 pixels per inch. Now, I could print at lower resolution, but I know that the printer driver on this happily accepts the high resolution, so it's not a problem in doing that. So I've got a high resolution image and I want to print that. I'm also going to print a black and white version of it. Now for the black and white conversion, I could do a fairly simple conversion on it here, but in this instance, I'm using Nick Silver FX, Silver FX 3. Now I've used this software for years. DxO run it now. Um, even if you've got the old free Google version and you're running it on old software, you can do the same thing. Why am I doing this particular one rather than a simple conversion? Well, the stonework, and I know this from printing pictures taken of uh, stonework in cathedrals, can often be, the detail, the structure in it, can often be relatively low contrast, particularly in the shadow areas on this particular picture here. So what I want to do is, I'm not going to do much in the way of adjustment. This is a fairly basic conversion. All I'm going to do is just add a little bit on the structure adjustment. Now, this is not sharpening as such. You could have do this with a version of unsharp masking with a large radius, small amount, uh, high radius, low amount sharpening, higher or lower it used to be called, may still be. Um, it's how to do this sort of sharpening about it. It's a structural type sharpening. It increases contrast on a very relatively large scale. And in this instance, brings out detail in the structure of the stonework, which is what I want for the black and white picture. So I've got that. I've got a black and white picture, so I've got color version and I've got a black and white version. I'm not entirely convinced on this picture which version will look best as a large print. Now, my personal preference is for the black and white. I like black and white. I'm going to print it on an art paper here. This is, uh, I'm using the ultra smooth fine art settings for this. I've tested and profiled this paper. It's uh, Innova IFA 14. Um, so it's very similar to the Epson uh, smooth, bright white uh, art paper. But the one thing I've noticed, I have produced a few test charts of here black and white whilst testing the paper. I've looked at that and I found that it crunches shadows a bit too much. So that means that I've actually decided to add a slight, slight curve to this. Now, the general shape of the curve and this particular image here is from the profile that was created during looking at that. Now, look at some of my other black and white correction stuff if you want details of why I'm doing this and how I do it, but I won't go into it here other than to say I have applied a curve. Now. That's to change the black and white. It's just to open out the shadows a little bit more. It will make the print here, or the image here on the screen, look a little bit light, but that's to counteract the crunching of the shadows. There is a lot of shadow detail in this picture, so I don't want crunched shadows in it. Now, for architectural images like this, my black and white choice is to have a relatively even tonality. Now, I know some people's tastes would be to have this look really harsh, dramatic, sharp. I just don't see architecture like that in these terms. If you do and you like that sort of print, you can edit a different way. I'm going for something that has the smoothness of the stonework. This stonework's been here for hundreds of years. I, want, I don't want it to look like this is the end of the world. You know, uh, there are storms gathering outside. I want this to look sort of some, a bit more refined. I want this to convey the stillness, the feeling I got actually visiting the place. I don't want people to go, ooh, and recoil from something like that. Your tastes may vary, but tastes are an important aspect of how you print. Now, what about fine detail sharpening? Well, and I will be looking at this again in it, I found that the combination of a bit of sharpening before I do the resizing sharpens linear elements in the image really quite well for print so that you don't 
get, you don't lose detail in the printing. The one area where I have sharpened, as I say in Nick Sharpener, not Nick Sharpener, in Nick Silver Effects, where I've increased the local structure. Now I'm going to be looking in a bit more detail at sharpening images. In particular, I've used Nick Sharpener 3 for years. Now I don't always use it myself, but I always use it when I'm explaining sharpening to people because it works very well. I'll put a link to the written articles in this in with this video. So if you want some more information on that, have a look at that. But I'm still working out the best way how I can show sharpening both in prints, on a screen, and in particular in a video. And it's a bit of a tricky thing because it's fine me saying, well, you just print and see what it looks like. But um, I appreciate that some people would actually like some basis to take that a bit further. But start off, have a look at some of my sharpening articles, which I'll put links to in here. If you've got questions, let me know. Because as I said, it's the questions which often give me ideas for doing videos, articles, etc. But anyway, some printing. First up, the colour print. Now this particular one, I'm printing from Photoshop here. Um, I would say that for making large prints like this, I find the ability to add curves and layers and stuff in Photoshop is a key element of my approach to doing large prints. If you want to use Lightroom, by all means use Lightroom for handling your images, processing them. But there is a certain point, I believe, when making large prints when you need to export them into something like Photoshop or even Affinity Photo. Much cheaper, excellent bit of software, that works virtually the same. Now, I'm running an old version of Photoshop here. This is Photoshop CS6 and it does everything I need. So don't think you absolutely need to get the latest version. If you've got a copy of Photoshop CS6 that will run on your computer, you can do all of this stuff. Um, so. Uh, it's worth considering. You don't have to go for the latest and greatest for this. Um, but here's the image here. I've opened up the print dialog. I've got it set. I'm fitting it at 100%. I've got a media size. I'm using a custom media size I made earlier, 24 inch by 36 inch. Does mean we're going to get slightly longer borders at the end, but I'm just printing on a currently, yeah, on an easy to use size. So we won't worry about that. I could trim it if need be. I could use a custom size. The key thing I would say is I'm using the profile I made, custom profile for this paper. Now the rendering intent I'm choosing, in this instance, I'm choosing perceptual. Now I always have a quick look at the soft proofing here to give an idea of whether I should choose relative colorimetric, which is the most common one I use, or perceptual. Sometimes the tonality of the two varies, and it certainly does given the way I make the, the profiles, there will be difference between them. I would always say I'll start with relative colorimetric and then I will maybe have a look at perceptual to see if there's any difference. It varies on an image by image basis, but in this instance I'm printing it at um, full size here, scale at 100%, it's printing at 638 pixels per inch. Ludicrously high, but it doesn't matter. Just does mean that fine detail will get sent to the print driver. I'm printing this at the maximum uh, print setting, or uh, it's about the, n not the absolute highest print setting, but near maximum. So I'm never entirely certain with these print settings. Sometimes I look at stuff and think it makes a difference. Sometimes I look at stuff and think it doesn't make much of a difference. On this one, because of the fine detail in the image, I'm printing it at the, highest, at the maximum quality setting. Now, don't need to do anything there. I've set the size, paper size, set for this, and I can just print. Now this will take a, this is a big image. So I'm expecting this to take a while to come through on the lap, from the laptop here. Printer's telling me it's going to take about eight minutes to print. This is a quick printer. Uh, even at the highest quality settings, it's a print set. It's a quick printer. Comes to paper loading through, I can check. This is the first chance you get to check that what you think is gonna come out is gonna come out. So this is the point where if it goes wrong, you can kill it here, but that looks fine. Color looks great. Detail looks great. Obviously I'll have a look at the print a bit closer when it prints, but here we go. Here's the print coming out. 
Well, good crisp detail even in the shadows. Now, this shouldn't come as a surprise now, but I haven't edited this image, obviously, on this laptop. It's a relatively low resolution, not a very wide gamut. I've edited this on a much better quality monitor. Now, it's in the Profoto color space. Um, as ever, people will ask, yes, it's Profoto color space. How do you handle the fact that there may be colors in the image that you can't display properly? The key element is can't display properly. Um, just because something is out of gamut doesn't mean it's suddenly invisible. Yes, you're seeing it, but it's perhaps not going to, giving a good illustration of how it's going to come out. Now, the real difference is the only place this ever really occurs much in an image like this is perhaps in some of the shadow detail near the, uh, or, uh, the base of the organ on there in the tower. Uh, there are a few bits there that may be out of gamut. But we're printing on a matte art paper, which has a slightly reduced gamut anyway, works well on this printer, but I have to allow for the fact that it's always the whole process of going from a captured image through to a print. What really matters is how the print comes out at the end. Now, I've edited enough images in a large color space to know, and I've, I've got articles and other things looking at aspects of this, to know that it's rarely a problem if you know what you're doing. Um, there are no brilliant bright colors in this that are likely to cause problems. Um, the stained glass in the windows is perhaps slightly overexposed. It's also towards the edge of the front. This is not a picture of the stained glass. If you're taking pictures of stained glass in cathedrals and churches, you need to be a lot more careful with your exposures and your processing. This is not there. The stained glass is just to add some color and give context to it in this color version of the picture. Now, I'm gonna print the black and white picture when I've done this, but how they vary, we'll have a look at when I've printed both of them. Should say, actually looking at the print here, there is quite a bit of detail in the stained glass. The combination of the sharpening software and the resizing, which does a bit of sharpening in itself, has actually made it look quite good. Now, it is not up to a proper photo of the stained glass, but certainly you can see quite a bit of detail in it. Certainly the one that is less brightly exposed. Always a problem inside churches, if you want stained glass, you need to expose for the stained glass. If you want detail, take a second picture perhaps, and then combine the two. But getting one picture at the moment which captures the brightness, the power, the, you know, the sheer impact of great stained glass is almost impossible if you want to capture the rest of the uh, scene as well. We've got to the end of the print, which means it's going to be, it says two minutes, it'll probably be not that long. It does always est overestimate slightly at the very end. But it's just printing the end of the print now. I've set this paper to auto trim, so I'll just catch the print when it uh, does trim. There we go. Now that has some of the delicacy of the stone. The image, the color is not really striking. This particular picture, if I was printing it in color, I'm tempted to say this one would look better on a brighter paper, but we'll see. This is a colour version, and I'm now going to print the black and white version. With the black and white version, I'm printing using the Epson ABW mode. Uh, there is a curve that I've added just to uh, slightly open up the shadows, so it should print OK. Um, very easy to do for this. The black and white conversion here, I've done nothing particular other than just, as I say, increase the structure command. So the uh, localized contrast enhancements. Not enough to start producing halos and the like, but certainly enough just to bring out the structure of the stonework a bit more. But anyway, once again, it's the same image. Um, this time I'm printing black and white. It's still 638 pixels per inch, and we'll send that to the 
printer. Right, this one says six minutes for this time. Bit print faster, printing black and white. I see it coming out. I've just got my extra strong glasses. This is a two pairs of glasses job to have a look at some of the fine detail in this print. And it looks good. Now, I always say that anyone who looks at a print at this distance is never going to buy one. Uh, that's because only other photographers are truly bothered about detail like this and they really are by other people's prints. I can see some quite crisp detail in this. The lines are as I'd expected from the processing I've done quite sharp. Certainly this image needed no additional sharpening. Looking at the colour of it and uh, taking off the excess number of glasses to, uh, to look at it Tonality wise, it's fairly good. I'm, I like black and white, as I say. Um, some people may prefer this one, some people may prefer the black and white one. If you're selling prints, doesn't matter what you think quite often. If the customers want color versions like this and the color versions sell, then the color version gets made. Your personal taste is for when you have exhibitions and the like and even if you're having an exhibition uh, and I've said this in I've got a video that looked at some of the aspects considering things for exhibitions um, be careful about curating your own work for exhibitions I found in general that photographers may absolutely lousy curators of their own work find someone you trust to help you they can see it differently. They don't have the personal investment that you have in particular images. Great when you're famous and people come to see you and you start referring to yourself by just a single word name. Great when you like that. But when you're actually interested in what makes a good collection of pictures, ask other people's advice. Um, I'm not always the best. I've got pictures that I absolutely love. But other people are just generally not interested. Now that doesn't matter. But if I'm selling pictures or selling prints, then it most certainly does matter. Just one point I should add about this image, and this is one of those things that will irritate some people and some won't even notice. Uh, there is in the bottom of the print, there is a small lectern that has been positioned not quite symmetrically in front of uh, uh, you know, the altar. Now, the problem is, and this, this is not the main altar by the way, um, this is just where part of services are carried out, but it's not central. Now, if I was taking this picture on a job, an architectural photography job, I would look around for things like that that break symmetry in slightly annoying manners. And I would be very careful in lining everything up. However, this is a handheld shot. This is taken walking around the cathedral as an ordinary visitor with a pass for taking photos. And this is literally, I think, yes, this will make a good photo move around a bit, have a look where I am, get a feel for the place, have a think of when I took that circular image that I was going to potentially stretch the image out to make it into a different view. And I've got a view here that covers all the way from looking out towards the main entrance of the cathedral, looking straight up in the tower with the scissor arches as a feature of it. Now we should be getting nearly to getting to see what the black and white picture looks like. Not quite, it's running a bit slow. Um, you can't help, sometimes it will run slow. I'm going to blame the laptop here. Um, as I said, this is a 2010 MacBook Pro. Um, one day I'll probably buy a new one, but um, I need more paying work for that. Um, this one works, does its job. I run a photography business, or I should say Karen and myself run a photography business, and our choices of when we get new kit are somewhat constrained by the need for the kit to actually pay its way. This still works, why buy new? Certain point I may need to, but not yet.
Well, that's speeded up a bit. Almost certainly the delay there was because of two huge great files opened up on the old laptop, but it's doing pretty well. Well, there we are. We have a black and white picture and a color picture. Now, both are of relatively low contrast because it's an art paper. Uh, it's what I expect from it. Now, it would be interesting, and I may, may yet do it if I uh, load up some different paper, to see these prints on different papers. The colour one in particular I'd like to see perhaps on a Baraita style paper where the greater tonal, tonal range of the paper will work nicely with the detail in this. For the black and white version I'm actually happy with this because I don't like for this subject strong, sharp, deep black and white. Now I do for some, uh, some pictures I do go for that and certainly some landscapes I prefer to have much more contrast in them but this particular range for this particular view there is the black and white view now that is the level of contrast I like in uh, architectural shots for interiors for old buildings like this for the color and once again I'm unsure how this will actually work on the video there is the colour version. They're both rather nice. Now this is an image taken years ago, reprocessed, different ways of covering it. Every image, you need to look at the image and think, what do I want the print to look like? How am I going to process this raw file? What is going to be my workflow right the way through? Now, I've picked a particular workflow here which involved using sharpening and then resizing. If I was making smaller prints, I probably wouldn't have done the resizing. There was enough detail in the 1DS Mark III files to handle it anyway. And a more traditional approach to sharpening, something like Nick Sharpener 3, would be much better. Now, you always have to be careful with any sharpening tools that they don't generate artifacts. With Nick Sharpener 3, I found one of the areas where I tended to sharpen an image and have the sharpened image as a new layer. I would then look at the sharpened image and see if there are any areas where sharpening artifacts had appeared. Now, normally the sharpening artifacts will be far too small a scale to see. Now, with two pairs of glasses on, I can just see very slight hints of it in this. But that's great because I need to look at it from literally a few inches away to see whether there are problems. With Sharpener 3, the area I found the most problem was distant mountains which had patches of snow on them. The high contrast of the snow against the background on Disney would just produce sharpening artifacts around the edges. Now, I've looked at this in detail in the written article, so if you're interested in this, please do have a read of the articles. As I say, they've got lots of pictures in them as well, so uh, it's not too much, of it, but have a look to see the effects that I'm describing here, because there are no issues here. Now, I can see perhaps one or two highlights here where maybe there's a little bit of oversharpening. Yeah, who's actually going to look at this picture this way? A picture this size is not created for somebody to walk up to and look at in detail. A picture this size is produced for you to look at from a reasonable distance. Now, I hope this video's been of interest. As I say, ask questions, please do, I welcome them. Um, there are lots of things I feel I should explain more of here, um, but I need to find good ways of explaining them. So please do subscribe to the channel. Um, I've got lots more stuff to do. And uh, thanks for watching.